traumatic elbow instability and terrible triad injuries. This is from the OTA core curriculum resident lecture series version five. Slides are by Dr. Wade Gordon and Chris Grandizio, and I'm Saqib Rahman narrating. So in the first video, we talked about anatomy, mechanism, and covered simple dislocations and their management. And we talked about how a complex dislocation is the term used when you're talking about essentially a fracture dislocation. So let's talk about that in this video. So, um, of course, you have a dislocation with a fracture. So uh, these can be coronoid fractures, montasia fracture, radial head fractures, or they can be epicondyle fractures in adolescence. And um, you can also get the transolecranon fracture dislocation. Now, the terrible triad is when you have a elbow dislocation with a coronoid and a radial head fracture. So we're actually going to treat that, um, we're going to talk about that in the next video. Um, and in this video, we'll focus on the other uh, complex elbow dislocations. But terrible triad is a complex elbow dislocation. So what about dislocations with radial head fractures? So remember there are classifications for uh, radial head fractures shown on the right, Mason classification, Broberg and Mori classifications. So first, you got to make sure you recognize that there is a radial head fracture. And sometimes on the x-rays, especially on the lateral image, and it, it just, there's a lot of it, certain fractures you may miss. Um, certainly uh, on the lateral x-ray can be a little harder, and uh, even on the AP x-ray as well. Um, and the problem is sometimes your AP x-ray initially is dislocated, and then your post-reduction x-ray you don't have a perfect AP because you're flexed. So you have to make sure you don't miss these. Um, now, whereas radial head fractures in many cases can be treated uh, maybe non-surgically, or sometimes there are some studies showing that you can treat isolated radial head fractures with excision um, in combinated patterns, and there actually is some data to support that. Um, when you have, remember that the radial head is um, one of the stabilizers of your elbow and you don't necessarily want to remove stabilizers when you have a situation of instability. So when you have a radial head fracture in the setting of a dislocation, you're going to have to repair or replace that fracture. So um, here you can see an example of uh, an approach to the elbow where there's a comminuted radial head uh, fracture. And you have to just remember, this is an important stabilizer to valgus force. So here's an example of a comminuted radial head fracture. Um, if you're going to treat these with osteosynthesis, uh, you do have to recognize the safe zones of fixation. Um, so for example, this tip of the screw here uh, may not be in that safe zone. So the safe zone basically means that you have this, um, uh, well, there's two things here. One, you can have screws screw that's um, The other thing with regards to the safe zone is actually if you're going to place uh, plates or um, if you're going to place non, or you're gonna place screws that are not headless, right? So if you have a traditional implant sitting on the radius, you can place them within this safe zone on the lateral aspect of the radius. So let's say you're going to use a plate, like a small T-plate like this. Um, you have to make sure that through full supination and full pronation that that plate is not going to impinge on the proximal radial ulnar joint, right? So you really just have about 90 degrees uh, of that safe zone where when you're in the in the where you know when you're in the neutral position that generally is going to be facing directly laterally and then as you can as you can see in supination that safe zone you know uh, is maxed out essentially and then in pronation it's maxed out again so here you can see with forearm rotation if you don't place your plate within that safe zone or if it's a normal a screw with a head uh, that doesn't countersink, that may impinge on the proximal radial ulnar joint. And of course, the other thing you have to make sure is that you know your implants don't enter the proximal radial 
proximal radial ulnar joint in any position of rotation. And I believe that we're seeing that here that I was pointing out previously. So when doing ORF of the radial head, especially with a plate, um, then you have to keep this in mind. Here's an example, patient with a fall off a 10 foot ladder. Uh, you can see that um, there's this injury to the wrist as well as uh, radial head fracture and uh, dislocation. This is after reduction. Um, so in this particular case, this is actually a um, fracture where you, this was treated with radial head arthroplasty. So it was not felt that the fragments were reconstructable. And if you have a comminuted fracture with three, four, five fragments, sometimes radial head arthroplasty is better. And uh, remember that when you're doing arthroplasty, this is not a weight-bearing joint. Um, this is not something where we usually um, get very uh, concerned about patient age as we would perhaps with uh, replacing a hip. Um, you know, if you have a somewhat younger patient and it's a non-reconstructable radial head uh, in your hands, then um, certainly radial head arthroplasty is acceptable. Uh, this is something that you are doing to provide stability, not necessarily replacing a joint so that it can bear weight. And in this case, is also uh, lateral collateral ligament reconstruction. And you can see at two years, there are some mild degenerative changes noted, but a reduced elbow. So some technical pearls. If you're going to do radial head replacement, don't overstuff the joint. What that means is don't put in an implant that has that's too uh, that that's that's too has too much of a radial neck length. You know, it's kind of tight going in, or is too wide medial to lateral. Like you don't want something with a diameter of the implant that's too big. Um, so you approximate the size of the elliptical portion of the native real, radial head, and it's usually several millimeters smaller than the outer diameter of the radial head. You reassemble fragments on the back table, and keep in mind the fragments are going to, they're never going to tightly, tightly fit all the way back together. So you have to take that into account. It's, it's probably going to be oversized if you measure that exactly. Um, and if you overstuff, I mean, by having too much length of your implant, this can cause pain, stiffness, capitellar wear. Uh, and you, you know, if, if there's very severe over lengthening, you'll see it on x-ray. But this is something that comes with experience and you have to make sure you're, you're, you're not doing it. It's a common error, so it's important uh, to, to think about this. Um, so direct intraoperative visualization of a gap in the lateral ulnar uh, humeral joint is the most reliable indicator uh, of overlengthening following insertion of the radial head prosthesis. And you want to ensure after you do this, you have congruent tracking with full range of motion, elbow flexion, extension, supination, and pronation. You want to observe that directly and also under fluoroscopy. So don't overstuff the radiocapitola joint when you replace these. And a lot of these implants are modular uh, nowadays, so they allow you to um, make sure you have the right size that's not overstuffing. And here you can see a reasonably good result with elbow flexion, extension, supination, and pronation at two years. Coronoid fractures. So um, even small coronoid fractures are important and can impact stability. Um, so same thing with the radial head. When you have a coronoid fracture and elbow instability, you're probably going to have to do something about the coronoid in, in, in most cases. And where that fracture occurs um, is kind of mapped out here. This is sort of a view if, as if you're looking... Uh, straight down at the at the coronoid uh, as opposed to a lateral view, and you can kind of identify some of the different fractures that um, you may see. So how do you get to these? Well, there are some medial approaches. Um, you could potentially also go direct to anterior if you're comfortable with that. Uh, if the fragments are large enough, you want to do open reduction internal fixation. Um, with you know, screws, plates and screws, you can potentially for smaller fragments do suture lasso or soft tissue reconstruction. Um, so for example, what he's describing here is if, if you look here, there's probably, this is where the fracture base is. The fragment looks like it's here. So what you could do is you could um, make drill holes uh, 
here and here, let's say, in which you then introduce a, uh, so these drill holes would go from the dorsal ulna into the fracture base. And if you want to target that accurately, you could use a guide like an ACL drill guide. And then once you have your two holes in the base of the fracture, you would then um, uh, put sutures, you know, in the capsule, uh, capsule attachments of your, um, your fragment here. And you would then use a suture retriever uh, to go in, come up here, grasp your, grasp your suture, um, another one here, grasp another suture, and then you'd pull these two sutures out here, and then you'd tie them on the dorsal surface of the ulna, and as you sort of, you know, pull down and tighten that, that uh, will potentially give you that suture repair. What about open uh, approaches for plate and screw fixation, where you can do a the medial over-the-top approach. Uh, it's described in the reference below in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma. This is in the interval between the pronator teres and common flexor origin, as shown here. You can also do a flexor carpi ulnaris split approach, uh, also shown in the reference below. Uh, this is the interval between the humeral and ulnar heads of the FCU. Uh, you track the ulnar nerve to the interval, and um, then you can e extend your split distally to the first motor branch of the ulnar nerve. There is also an anterior approach. Uh, if you choose to go that way, um, there's a reference in the footnote below. And in this, um, you um, incise the biceps aponeurosis and the intervals between the radial artery and median nerve. And then the brachialis is divided to expose the coronoid. So um, in this case, back to our case, um, surgical approach, you can come medially, protect and transpose the ulnar nerve, reflect the flexor pronator mass distal from the origin. Uh, you could also, uh, if you had a radial head fracture, you could go through the radial head fracture and address this first. So many times if you have a terrible triad, that's exactly what you would do, uh, is you would get to the coronoid through the radial head fracture site before you replace or fix it. So that's another approach. Um, here's an example of a patient fall off the back of a truck and you can see a coronoid fracture better characterized on CT scan images after reduction of the elbow. And this is treated with um, medial approach to the coronoid, FCU split, uh, anterior medial facet fragment is fixed. Uh, and then in a separate lateral approach, um, there's an extensor digitorum um, common split and uh, lateral collateral ligament repair. It's probably worth pausing for a second to just revisit a concept about the um, ulnar collateral ligament. So if you recall, we talked about how the lateral collateral ligaments, um, act, they actually are, um, they actually provide valgus instability, right? So if you looked at this like it was a knee, right? And this is the, and this was the femur and this was your tibia, for example, right? So if this was the lateral collateral ligament, you know, you would say, okay, well, that provides stability against varus forces, right? So, uh, and it, when it's disrupted, you may have varus instability, but how is it that the lateral collateral ligament in the elbow provides valgus instability. We talked about how in the first video, you create instability with supination valgus and uh, axial loading. And you may want to look up the pivot shift maneuver or physical exam test, which, you know, which, which basically reproduces that mechanism to induce the subluxation. So again, how is it that the lateral side ligament is providing valgus instability? Well, it's because it's basically preventing the radial head from coming out. So that lateral ulnar collateral ligament is sitting here posteriorly, and then you have your annular ligaments also. But this is providing instability. So when, you, when you're going, when you have a valgus force, what's happening is this radial head here, it kind of wants to sort of come out this way, you know, if you, if you had uh, nothing preventing it, right, it's, it's generally going to come in this direction. So that's where, and you can see the suture anchor here that they use to help repair and reconstruct this. 
uh, and probably repair back to the the humeral epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. So that lateral collateral ligament here is acting like a little bit of like a like a sling uh, to prevent that radial head from coming out this way. So it's sitting posterior and lateral, and it prevents that radial head from coming out in valgus stress. Okay, so when that's disrupted, you can have instability, and it's imperative in many of these cases, and especially the terrible triad injuries, that you have to repair that um, or reconstruct it. Uh, otherwise, you will have recurrent instability. So what about the trans fracture dislocation? So this is somewhat more of a direct blow or a pilon fracture of the elbow. The radius and ulna displaced in the same direction, typically. So this is not exactly a Montasia injury. Um, the radiocapitellar joint is dislocated, but that proximal radial ulnar joint remains intact. If we go back to this one, you can see that you know the relationship here is um, between the radius and ulna are still maintained. Um, so treatment is typically ORIF of that proximal ulna fracture, uh, including the coronoid fragment, assess stability again, uh, because if you do get a malreduction, it's going to make uh, concentric reduction, malreduction of the fracture, it's going to make concentric reduction of the um, of the ulnar humeral joint impossible. So here's an example, uh, right transolecranon fracture dislocation. Here you can see the radiocapital joint dis uh, dislocated anteriorly. This is treated with open reduction and internal fixation of the proximal ulna with reduction in, of the radiocapital joint. Um, and uh, these are post-op images. And uh, as with many um, uh, proximal ulna and olecranon fractures, you may have to require, you may have to remove hardware as was done here. So what about epicondyle fractures? So these are, th these are phenomena that can happen in adolescence where you can have fracture through the, um, through the uh, physis here, the ligaments can be intact and you need to manage these a little differently than just an isolated epicondyle fracture because the, the fragment, and you know, it imparts stability. So getting that fragment fixed will um, help uh, keep your elbow stable. So we'll show you some examples of that. So here's an elbow dislocation in adolescent. Uh, Post-reduction, I mean, you can see there's medial epicondyle fracture uh, treated with uh, open reduction internal fixation. Well, why? Well, here you can see a 14-year-old female gymnast, valgus injury, uh, dislocation with a medial epicondyle avulsion fracture. It's closed reduced. Look at the stress views, right? So, you know, here's your here's your stress view. So, with valgus stress, you can see tremendous instability. So, this is treated with open reduction internal fixation. You can see with uh, tension band construct, and that restores stability to valgus stress. All right, so we're going to pause there, and as I mentioned, we'll also talk about another complex dislocation, which is the terrible triad injury in the next video. Thanks.